Hello, ghouls and goblins, and welcome back to Bride of Alternate Ending. I am your co-host, Brennan Klein, and with me, as always, is one Mr. Tim Brayton. How are you doing today, Tim? I, I was doing better 30 seconds ago because I thought we'd landed on you calling yourself our ghost and me your co-ghost okay. as our bit, and then I... we're not doing it. Basically, after every recording of a podcast, my brain gets wiped, um, so I really need to to study up on what we talked about last time. So Okay, well, I, I am, other than that disgusting lapse, I'm doing very well. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> um, I'm doing all right. As you can see... Um, so I, I, I warned you before this, before this recording, but I, I cut my hair cause I've been growing it out ever since the pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. but I cut it, I'm trying to go for a, a curly mop top kind of thing. I actually, um, I, I always like to be like any human being. I like to be special. Mm-hmm. Um, and whenever I do something that feels like I'm the only person in the world to have done that, I don't, I, I don't, uh, uh, manipulate situations to make that happen but once it has happened i kind of feel good about myself like oh i think i think i might be unique out there in the world so i think i did that because i might be the only person who has brought a picture of Corey cunningham from halloween ends to their uh to their barber to say i want to look like this let's let's put it this way i hope you are Mm-hmm. I, I deeply, deeply hope that's the case. Uh, I will say right now, and you're in a sort of uh, what we call a liminal state uh-huh. in the the film theory biz, uh, which is to say you're you're not you're not anything yet. You you are no longer who you were, and you are not yet who you will be. Yeah, wise. not a girl, not yet a woman. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you you feel to me like the vibe I'm getting is that I'm doing a podcast with a uh, a 1970s. Tennis player who's very good, but not one of the household names level good. Oh, that's 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 pretty accurate. I I would go for either Art Garfunkel or a brunette, the greatest American hero. But uh, we're kind of in the same kind of era. I, I think we're we're talking about all the same thing because it's it's not like the Gar- Art Garfunkel who recorded Bridge Over Troubled Water. It's the Art Garfunkel who kept talking in print about how it's not his fault that Simon and Garfunkel are getting back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, that's what's going on with me. I'm, I'm, I'm living in that liminal space. I get to wash it tomorrow, and then thing, things are gonna, things are gonna get cooking from you'll, there. You'll feel better once you can get it washed. Yeah, exactly. I'll feel better once you can get it washed. Exactly. It's gonna be great and for I, everyone. I'll bet a lot that Ben will feel better once you can get it washed. Yeah, probably. I feel like he's been biting his tongue. Um, but yeah, the so this is my first time getting a perm, and the one thing I knew about getting perms that you're not supposed to get it wet for the first couple days. And I learned that from Legally Blonde. So thank you to cinema. Uh, I mean, the most important parts of cinema are the ones that teach us about uh, hair care, I think. Yeah, probably. To to me, the single thing that I learned in a movie that I think about the most is in uh, Miller's Crossing, where John Polito has a line about how the way to get a really close shave is to use cold water to rinse the razor because the metal will contract and it'll it'll cut fine oh yeah see because the you know the truths about the world that the oscars like to convince us that cinema is teaching us we we can learn those from a lot of places where else are you Mm going to learn how to shave exactly um anyway so what we're here to talk about today is not a personal grooming it is in fact the first week of a brand new month it is march in case you hadn't noticed um, thanks to Oscar level Patreon member Gavin McDowell, uh, he has requested that we do a month themed after religious horror films that aren't, uh, you know, Christian. The, the religion is not Christianity. Yes, exactly. Um, which is very, very interesting because obviously Christianity is so steeped in the horror genre. Like even even among filmmakers that are, you know, firmly secular or atheist, like the second you get a kind of possessiony movie in, we're we're throwing crosses around. Um, it's it. We're yeah. Both both vampire movies and exorcism movies are are just so 
reliant on the iconography of the Christian church. Yeah, it, and it, it's it's always exciting to come across something that isn't from that milieu, but it is also extremely rare, which is why we had a very limited uh, number of options this time. But I think we came up with some really interesting ones, and the one that people voted for us to talk about is the uh, 2018 Indian horror film Tumbad, which is steeped in Hindu mythology and mysticism. I do not personally wish to talk about the details of that too much because I know very little and will just come across like an idiot but that that's kind of the the milieu that we're that we're approaching here yeah I know more than very little although possibly still not enough to to prevent myself from seeming like an idiot um I will say one of the things that I do know is that practitioners of Hindu are generally less how to how to phrase it uh they're less precious about the details of their religion than than what we would think of as very religious christians in the united states like there's a level of flexibility and a level of they sort of know that what they're talking about is symbolic more than literal and i think that that is very <clears throat> very much reflected in in this film's uh theology which is to the best of my knowledge, at least, not real theology. It's it's sort of more like a fanciful what if story. Yeah, because it, it opens with the monologue explaining the thing that the film is doing with the mythology. And I, yes. I think the idea is we are adding something to the kind of pantheon that has not existed before. Exactly. I feel like the equivalent, or an equivalent, I shouldn't say the equivalent, if a filmmaker were to tell us the story of how Jesus and Satan were actually brothers and God made Jesus because God was so angry at how bad he fucked up when he made Satan. That would sort of be in the the wheelhouse of, of what we've got here. The difference being that you can do that in Hindu and it will not get your house burned down. Yeah. And also because, you know, it's, it's a uh, polytheistic kind of situation. So there, there's less... I I imagine when there's hundreds of different figures that you're dealing with, you're less precious about each one of them. I think that's that's the the deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So basically, what we're dealing with here is that there is a a first child of the goddess of prosperity who was so greedy um, that he has kind of been stricken from the, the record from any ancient texts and tomes and whatnot. Yeah, um, basically, uh, his his punishment. His, his mother was able to keep him alive, but his punishment was that no one would worship him. He would be forgotten. Yes, he would be forgotten. Alive, but forgotten. Yeah, and he is uh, kind of existing inside of her womb, and it's kind of this... It's a liminal space, just like my hair. Um, but basically, there is this small Indian town of Tumbad that has built a shrine to this to this uh, deity called Hastar. That's the, the deity's name. Or, or demon, or whatever whatever English word that is insufficient to describe what, what mm-hmm. Hastar is. Um, so Tumbad has built a shrine to Hastar, thus Tumbad is cursed with constant rain. Um, it is this incredibly dreary, overpowering, gray wetness, but it is also has access to to Hastar's immense treasures and fortunes, but... But enough about Los Angeles in February 2023. Oh my god, eh? Tim. It's been... It has been wild. It snowed. It snowed right I outside my window. I know. Mine too, but I expect it. Yeah, that that's... I mean, that's still very nice, but my, less... My city uh, has an infrastructure built to accommodate when that happens. Yeah, no, every, everything has fallen down. Everything is crumbling. <laughs> um, it's been pretty pretty exciting over here. Yes. But yes, it is basically L.A. over the past two weeks. Um, but yeah, in Tumbad, you, the the town itself is essentially two locations. That's all we see. We don't get the sense of anyone else existing in Tumbad, Tumbad other than that there is a big mansion and that there's this kind of scary shanty that the, the main characters live in in the first chapter. Yes. Anyway, yeah, and, so... Yeah. And my understanding is that Tumbad exists, but this is not designed to actually replicate it. Yeah, that that makes sense. And um, 
the English language is very tied in with Indian filmmaking because guess what? The English uh, were in control of India for a long time, so our, our uh. words are floating around a lot. So I think they probably also picked it because of the way that it sounds. It sounds like tomb. Like I think that is probably an intentional oh, choice. Oh, it does. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, That's I, nifty. Yeah, I can't be one hundred percent certain, but an English language pun would not be outside of the realm of possibility for an Indian film. Tomb bad. Yeah, exactly. I like it. You you've made me bump this movie up to four and a half stars just by telling me that. Hell yeah, baby. <laughs> Um, but yes, so the the plot is really simple. Like we can get into it pretty quickly. Um, do do you want to start, and we can kind of volley back and forth a little bit? I mean, you you sort of have started. As yeah, the, I guess yeah, so, yeah. so. Um, so I I actually don't have character names in front of me, and I don't oh, want to okay. fuck up character names. So why don't you start, and then I will get ready to volley back and forth. Okay, with with the okay. Look, whenever I talk about a, a film that's uh, in. The language of Hindi, which I believe I'm double checking this one. Yeah, it's, this it's was in, a Hindi language. Film, yeah, it's yeah. in Hindi I, and Marathi. I it is in Marathi because I I, dub, I wanted to double check that because the historical actual town of Tumbad is a Marathi speaking part in a Marathi speaking re, speaking region. But my sense was that this was a Hindi language film. Yes. Um. So I I tend to like to like really dig in and and do some practice before I pronounce anything in Hindi because it is not a language system that is in any way similar to the ones that I am familiar with. Um, I did not have that time this week, unfortunately, but uh, to my knowledge, the main character's name is Vinayak Rao. Um, And that's the only character whose name we really need to know, so that's fine. That's true, actually, because the rest are all sort of named things like mother and grandmother. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then Hostar, of course, is the, the demonic Hostar presence. Hostar is the demonic presence, yes. Um, but yeah, so we first encounter this man as a 14-ish year old child in uh, English-occupied India in the mid-1910s. Um, his mother is a mistress of the man who owns the mansion. There is... Uh, I, I wouldn't call myself an Indian cinema or Bollywood expert, but I've certainly... I'm the person... I am the white person that I know who has seen the most Indian movies. Um, and this is the most explicit sexual moment I've ever seen in an Indian movie. Is I I certainly know less than you do. Um, I had been led to believe it was a national cinema in which sex scenes were sort of specifically not done. And it really threw me <laughs> to have yeah. the film open this way. I, I thought it was depicting something else at first. I was like, wow, how unusually like a hand job this scene appears to be. Yes, me too. Because of the, the same thing, especially at least, you know, the mainstream Bollywood cinema that gets put out is basically you get a kiss and that's what's going to happen. Or they'll it's it's the same thing that any sexually uh, uh, buttoned up culture has, which is that they're kind of obsessed with the idea of sex, but not the depiction of sex. So it's like, mm-hmm. like you the know, moments. yeah, exactly. So it's like. There's, you're gonna get like skimpy outfits, and then the implication that characters have sex, but something this explicit, which is a woman uh, with her back to the camera and a man lying down in front of her, and her, you know, jogging her 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 arm up and down, it is explicit for for this kind of uh, milieu. From what I'm I, familiar with, I would not expect to see it in an American film. It's explicit for our milieu, frankly. Yeah, that too. But yeah, anyway, so that was really interesting. I was like, she's probably using a mortar and pestle or something, and I'm just, you know, being a prurient American viewer. But no, it is. She is jerking this dude off. She sure is. She sure is. Which is a very exciting way to open any movie. Agreed. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, she is a mistress to this guy. He has basically promised her this gold coin that is part of the shrine to, to Hostar in his mansion. But it has become clear that he has no intention of giving it to her. She has been his mistress for 12 years. Mm-hmm. She has also been in charge of taking care of his decrepit grandmother, who has become this monstrous creature with her mouth nailed shut, who keeps kind of gibbering about knowing where the treasure is. And she has to feed her and make sure that she stays asleep. Um, and that that is her, her goal, other than jerking off this old dude. I mean... That is her goal. Jerking off the old dude is is what facilitates her goals. Yes. Shall we say. Yeah. Um, 
But anyway, so the old dude dies. Um, he leave. So he has had two children by by this woman. Mm-hmm. Um, the old dude dies, leaving the mansion and everything to. I guess the children is what makes the most sense as far as how that would go, but potentially to her, it's unclear. It's unclear. Doesn't doesn't wholly matter. Really. Yeah, it, it it really doesn't. But anyway, the the this mansion is now in the uh, possession of this family. Um, but in in the first uh, portent of things to come, the mere mention of this treasure has a kind of sinister power that that causes the younger brother to fall out of a tree and die. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, they leave town. We cut to fifteen years later. Uh, a now like late twenties married adult. Uh, did, oh, did I skip over something you want to talk I, about? I was gonna, I was going to say you you've forwarded us you've, you've just a little bit too quickly, uh, because in the process of the younger brother dying, the elder brother who is our narrator, uh, the mm-hmm. film actually starts in 1947, which is a charged year for a film set in India. Uh-huh. Um, the film sets starts in 1947, where he is telling the story of what happened over the last 30 years to his son. Mm. Uh, so. The the young version of Vinayak is called upon to do the work of of ha- of feeding the grandmother mm-hmm. uh, himself and and manages to almost get killed in doing so, but he is he is at the last moment able to recall the the sort of invoke the name of Hastar to make her go to sleep um, and saves himself. But there is a the first of the film's big old set pieces is the one where he is kind of pressed into going going to wherever it is that she's stored. So oh, yeah. Weird, weird cave. Oh, yeah, and she is this incredible piece of movie monster creation. This this is one of the reasons I wanted to make sure we stopped to talk about it. Yeah. I, she's good. She's I, real good. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, can, we can get granular, because I, I was going to give the, like, basic plot synopsis and then, like, really dive in, but yeah, let's do it, okay. because... She looks really, really cool. Like I said, she's got her mouth nailed shut. Um, there's this really disgusting part where she's uh, hungry and she's threatening that she's going to eat this kid. And she starts pulling the nail out of her mm-hmm. mouth and it's this kind of dripping blood onto him. It's 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 mm-hmm. really it's really good stuff. Okay, we we can we don't have to be so granular. I, just, I liked the moment. And I wanted to to tip our hats to it before we walked on. Oh yeah, you gotta. And then um, of course the the grandmother kind of. You know, she comes back in a big way in chapter two. She sure um, does. She sure does. It has this very magic realist um, approach, especially to the grandmother scenes that I, I find fascinating. Because basically, he he returns 14 years later. He's, you know, now a grown man. Um, he's seeking his fortune. Because even as a kid, he was obsessed with getting the treasure out of this mansion to the to the mm-hmm. point of distraction, to the point of not really caring that it destroyed his brother. Um, and so he comes back. His grandmother is still alive. She is just this kind of shriveled, disembodied head that is sh- shrunk into the dirt and has this giant tree growing out of it. Yes. And the, I, I mean... Ma- magical realism will always have a special place in my heart because I, I love the idea of just like, yes, I am a tree now. Um, mm-hmm. And we're not worried about this and it's great. Well, it's not great, but like, it's great to, to witness as an audience. It, it's great spectacle. Yes. It, it's good cinema. Anyway. So she asks him to burn her. That's the only way to release her from the physical pain of this manifestation of herself, even though she will never be released of the, the great hunger that she has been cursed with. Um, so essentially we, we get a little bit of, uh, Vinayak's life in the city where he has taken up residence in a kind of shitty apartment with a wife who is, who has started her own business grinding flour, which infuriates him because he treats himself like a rich person before he is one. Mm -hmm. Um, he starts coming back and forth to town bearing these gold coins um, implying that he did find the source of the, the treasure in the mansion um, and starts to kind of, you know, build, build a life for himself, including purchasing a record player. He gets himself a mistress, um, lots of all all the, all the things that indicate that you would be a a rich person in in this city. Yes. 
Um, and eventually we learn what it takes to to acquire this treasure. Um, we cut to another decade and a half later where his son is now the age that he was in the first sequence and is being trained on how to acquire this treasure. And it's all, all in service of a big parable about how greed maybe isn't the best way to live your life. It, uh, it is definitely a film that is very, very forward in making sure that we understand the theme. It in fact opens the very, very, very first thing we encounter in the film is a quote from Gandhi about how greed destroys the world. Uh, and and very much the, the film, it turns out to be, it's bad to want lots of money. And it will lead you to make terrible decisions that imperil the lives of yourselves and others. And indeed, even even your, your, cell, your soul, your like spiritual essence, becomes sort of corroded and corrupted and, and turned into something monstrous we see we see lots of people get turned into these weird demony creatures mm -hmm. as the grandmother was turned into by the time the movie is done by lots i mean not lots but some one per chapter and there's three chapters so that's, exactly one that's per chapter and there's three chapters yes uh which speaks to i think just how how clean the structure of this film is um you compare it to magical realism and i think that fits i would i would go so far as to compare it even to more like a sort of just campfire story or folklore it, it's really it's burning it's it's winnowing things down to this level of just like real basic stuff and it always ends with this kind of horrible punchline uh and just nice clean spooky story which apparently is more or less how it started um based on what i've read about this film's origin uh the director rahi anil barva was on a camping trip and one of his buddies was trying to recap the story of this novel and um freaked him out and so when he was 17 years old he wrote a story treatment and then spent like 20 years trying to get that story treatment turned into a movie and wow here we are including apparently this was no less than the third time he shot the footage and the first two times he was like nope that didn't turn out the way i wanted it to and scrapped it Wow, that's I mean, you know, that's that's it's clearly a labor of love, and it's clearly yes. it's got such a strong vision to it. Yes, yes, it and does. that that can't be denied at all. I, I haven't seen any of his other films. I don't even know if he has other films, but I I'd definitely be curious about checking them out. Yeah, I I would certainly like to see if there's more where this came from. I I know nothing about the filmmaker other than what I just said. So. Yeah, th this is this is my first uh, dive into this director and these stars, but I think I think basically the the whole team here is clearly working on all cylinders. I think the the actors. I don't know if there's a performance that's like, wow, that bowled me over, but that's because the characters are such uh, uh, totems for mm -hmm. ideas rather than actual layered human beings. Yeah, no, I mean, like in a very real sense, the only character who is like a character is Vinayak and all the other characters are sort of stereotypes is the wrong word because that it has a negative connotation I think it works for the story that's being told but they are types for sure yeah it, it, it's, it's a fable you know it, it's, it's a, a fable it's, it's it's not meant to be this like really intense character study of course you know it, it's it's a study of greed it's not a study of Vinayak right um and to, to, to that end, I think that might be my uh, my stumbling block with the movie because I, I saw your letterbox review. Everything you said about it, I 100% agree with. It just, the parts that, uh, basically anytime we leave Tumbad, um, my interest falls off a cliff. Um, I wasn't interested in anything that was going on in the city and we do spend a lot of time there learning about his life and not not things that I found particularly compelling. And that's and that's fair. Uh, for me, what kept me going through those scenes, which are, to be clear, the worst part of the film, mm. objectively, uh, the whole film is shot. And I'm looking at the cinematographer's name real quick, uh, Pankaj Kumar. Um, the whole film is shot in this like extremely heavy aesthetic, this very shovey, aggressive aesthetic of like 
what is the smallest amount of light we can use in this moment. Lots and lots of shadows, uh, including in like very run of the mill interior scenes with like daylight filtering through the windows. Uh, they're still trying to make sure that they create these like shadowy spaces and like faces are kind of half covered in shadows and half covered in light. And it's it's very gloomy looking. Yes. The movie as a whole in every last single scene is just so dark and gray. And and I mean we 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 made the joke about, you know, the weather, but that that's what it looks like, right? Like this is a very yeah. very grim movie. Um and and when a movie is just going that hard on atmosphere I, I sort of feel the atmosphere even in the scenes where it's a bit talkier and plottier and that kind of sweeps me through to the next the next bit. And this movie has a decent number of bits and they're good bits. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. Well, that's what I'm trying to express because I gave this movie three stars and you gave it four stars. This time. Um, and I, I certainly uh, am not... I, I am of the... Can- I'm like three stars with a heart, let's say. Um, because that atmosphere... I recognize that it is incredibly well done and ex- exactly providing the vision with the thing that it was asking for. Um, but it's, it's, it's a particular, that particular atmosphere um, is not one that compels me in my bones. And that's just a personal thing. Sure. Like I have the same stumbling block with the witch. It's such a crushingly gray movie. Mm. Um, it just, it doesn't spark anything within me to be that, gloomy and dim sure um i think that and and that that is not a thing that is the movie's fault that is just one of my like internal wiring things Mm. um i i like things that are a bit bolder and more colorful and more surreal like you know like let's like like think about a suspiria like something that is equally drenched in atmosphere and equally horrifying and weird maybe equally is a strong word but like the, it, doing a similar thing, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, and that's sure. kind of where, where my heart lives. No, and, and that makes a ton of sense. I think comparing this film to Suspiria feels like a thing we were inevitably going to get to. I'm glad you brought it up and not me, because then I would feel like a parody of myself. Uh-huh. But in terms of the, like, the plot is kind of this weird and wobbly thing that's really just about sort of ushering us into these moments of sort of visceral surreal horror but I do think the difference is exactly the one you pin down like what defines this movie like like to me the shot of of Tumbad um is the exterior of the mansion where it's just this like huge charcoal gray rectangle Mm -hmm. standing against a little patch of of gray of green grass and a little patch of like bluish gray clouds um and it's just this extraordinary image that i think we see three times and of course it's it's the sheets of rain coming down um i i just completely went gaga for that shot but it is certainly it is oppressive rather than exciting and and mm-hmm. I can absolutely see how that would be someone's someone's response. For me, I think I'm I'm perhaps wired in almost exactly the opposite way that you are, where this like this sort of really oppressively gloomy thing is is so much what I think of when I think of of horror and, and whatnot. Like mm-hmm. my my ideal kind of day to think about like ghostly shit is an autumn day where it's very overcast and the air is very damp, but it's not actually raining. Like, that's kind of peak Halloween weather for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, I'm sure that the part of the difference here is that I grew up in the Midwest and you grew up in Southern California, so that's that's a kind of day that I experience a ton right in that exact part of the year when my mind is, like, thinking about ghosts and ghouls and, and what have you. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm sure there's just, like, a, a sort of association that gets built there. But... Uh, gray skies and rain are are where I want my horror films to be. And and I get that that's not everyone's cup of tea for sure. Yeah, well and and I I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying there are there are ways to even shoot that that would be more compelling to me personally. 
like I, I think like like the ghostly hauntingy things that I that I that kind of are c- c- coming to mind for me right now are the kind of like over designed ornate kind of music box designs of like sure. the haunting or even like that Daniel Radcliffe movie The Woman in Black or okay. or something where it's like this kind of like sprawling intense uh, building more than it is the weather but the weather's part of can be part of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, cause I guess you're right. Like your, your Halloween, your ghost story is the Midwest Halloween that John Carpenter's Halloween is trying to evoke. And my Halloween is the actual Pasadena <laughs> Halloween that they, I was uh, gonna say. they did, they did have. <laughs> no, that tracks. And I mean, I, I was as much in that moment thinking of, of why I love the witch. Cause I mean, as we know, I, I, I think the witch is an A-OK motion picture, but, um, I really like the witch too. I just, th- that, that particular aspect of it doesn't do anything for sure me. oh that that aspect of it does a, a lot for me is, is what i'm saying um no so i mean I, I think that that there's a lot of validity what you're to what you're saying it is a very monotonous film tumbat is and, yes and the 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 tone that it, it is it has is good for me yes and i think the it's one of those things where the monotony of much of it helps highlight those other elements like even that 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 shot of the mansion that you're talking about it 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 has this kind of this kind of inexorable plodding towards doom feeling mm-hmm. toward it every time someone approaches the mansion that that's the thing it's it's a shot that when you see it it just reads it's like if you go in there you will die yes that is a, that is a graveyard building it is a, it is just a big fucking ugly granite monolith sort of squatting in the rain like a giant angry toad. Yes, exactly. Uh, and yeah. Um and I think the the grayness of the rest of the movie, you know, also serves as a counterpoint to the extreme redness yes. of the big special effects set pieces of the second and third chapters. Yes. Um when we go into the womb, which turns out to pretty literally be what the room is just what, what's being described, it's this big round red space where the walls are are wet and and visceral um and that is that is in fact where where he has been finding these gold coins all along uh it is a really shocking set and the way it's filmed and the way we sort of inhabit it is is really just it is it is something that feels otherworldly in the context of this film it is it is this kind of eruption of the other thing that I was not aware that you got in Indian cinema, which was no holds barred gore effects. And and maybe that is, is speaking to my parochialism, but I was not aware that you could get away with quite as much violence as we see in this movie. I, my experience with modern Indian horror is limited to Tumbad. Um, okay. I've seen a lot of 80s Indian horror and modern Indian action and romance. So I don't know what we're dealing with in horror, but certainly in action, we are action in, in mainstream Bollywood cinema is very much dance. Um, like the dance and the action are kind of two sides of the same coin. So mm-hmm. it's less about the violence of it. So this is certainly the most violent movie of this kind that I've seen also. Okay. But I, I, I can't speak to other major horror properties like Boots or, or other things that have come out in the last 10 years or so. Gotcha. But yeah, no, so so that would be just sort of where I, I was at. And basically just agreeing with what you said is that the, the grayness leads us to the redness in a way that feels very exciting. Yeah, and, and, and those sequences are so just phenomenally rendered both uh both in terms of the special effects but also just the 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 creation of this mythological world i mean one of the things that i like the most in um especially horror but in in most things that are meant to build tension in the audience in some way is i really like when a character is thrust into a situation or or put into a room with a character that operates by a very specific set of rules that you are not invited to know agreed so it's 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 clear that everything that's happening is happening for a reason but the reason is this completely unfathomable thing where you're like have i have i done something wrong that could 
doom me in this moment. There, you, you just, you, you cannot decipher what the rules are, and you just have to exist in that space and try to survive and hope that it's going to work out for you. Mm-hmm. No, um, those, those, this womb-based set pieces are. I hate to say like they're clearly the best part of the film because it feels like they're they're meant to be and they're so showy and it's like I, I wish I, I could I could not be a cliche as much as to say these are the best parts but they are um exactly for what you say we sort of we watch what's happening it's never explained we can sort of suss out a little bit of what's going on as we watch it uh in yeah, a way and, such hmm? and the third act makes at least what they are doing more clear yes than what and, the humans are doing what the humans are doing and and that's the thing like when it gets to the final iteration of the set piece We've learned enough by watching other iterations of it that it now we can like we can parse it like we know what's going wrong. It, it reminds me here is here is the I am a vulgar cliche of myself version of, of the day. Uh, it reminds me a lot of John Dealman where okay <laughs> in order to understand how horribly wrong her third day is going, we needed to see every detail of her first day and then the film does not have to tell us things are going wrong it just trusts us to see no that's not right Mm -hmm. and i think some of that's going on with that last iteration of the set piece yeah very much because uh, well i mean we'll we'll get into it uh we're getting very much into spoiler territory not that i wouldn't say tumbad is a spoilable movie anyway it's mainly about atmosphere and the things that you were looking at. But yeah, if you want to avoid spoilers, definitely click off now. If you have Prime Video, it's it's on there for free, so check it out. Um, anyway, so basically, ha- uh, Hostar, the demon, they basically go down... Okay, so the mythologically, Hostar was able to get all of the treasure of the goddess, but he was not able to get any of the food because he was greedy for both. Which is which is built right into that Gandhi quote that the film opens with. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so basically, instead of like a circle of salt, which is a, a more kind of Judeo-Christian mm-hmm. t- type of uh, a preventative thing, it's a circle of flour because flour is essentially the thing that Hostar both desires the most and is afraid of the most. It's, it's strongly implied that Hostar is, is celiac. Oh, of course, exactly. Um, he's very. I just realized I, ha- I have I have a celiac friend. I need to tell him that this this is the world's worst celiac horror movie. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So basically, they create this almost voodoo doll kind of humanoid figure out of dough that they bring as a kind of tribute to Hastar. Not tribute, like sacrifice tribute. Like they, it it's, is both. It's, it's like the monster bait in a Zelda game. Yeah. It's sort of it the is, way I read it. It is both what summons him and then distracts him enough for them to kind of yank out his loincloth and let a bunch of golden coins come flying out of his butt area. Yes. It it looks like he's pooping a river of gold coins, and I'm not sure if that's a creative choice or if I'm just reading it that way because I am a five-year-old child. I think it's probably a creative choice because it is connected with food in that way. And this That's character true. who doesn't eat. And it's kind of the idea that he's greedy for both things. So maybe one is kind of pushing the other out. I don't know. Um, but anyway, they seem to think that is linked to the loincloth as opposed to the, the butt or the, the rectum necessarily. I mean, um, we see the loincloth. We see them pull open the loincloth. So like, that's yeah. the only reason I'm, I'm not sure. But yes. Anyway. He poops gold all over the floor, and they scoop up as much as they can before he notices what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. And then they basically... So they are safe within the circle of flour that they have created on the floor, but then they have to climb back up the rope, and the rope is not within that circle of protection. So they need to climb up while he's still eating, and he will chase them out of the womb, and they have to kind of, like, slam this lid closed before he can reach them at the top. Yes. Which is always incredibly tense and grotesque and terrifying. It's... It's great because it's the world's most like straightforward. I'm not doing anything creative in how you're going to be scared by this, but it is so goddamn intense every time we see it. Yeah, it's it's super effective. Um, and yeah, so basically, you know, ultimately, this movie is a it, it's it's a 
fable about how greed will eventually destroy you. And wanting more than what you deserve is not a way to live your life. Um, so the kid has this idea that if we can just steal the loincloth itself, we can have infinite gold coins. It's the missing no glitch. Um, that's that's a, that's a joke <laughs> for all you Pokemon heads out there. I was going to say, I was just nodding. I had no idea what the fuck you just said. <laughs> Ah, I just you're 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 a Game Boy, so I thought it might it might land for you. But Pokemon, not, not Pokemon, Pokemon was um by the time Pokemon came around, I was too old for it. Yeah, um, fair enough. It is it is a learn how to play JRPGs for for a time when I was already ass deep in Dragon Quest and uh, Final Fantasy. Nah, fair enough. Um, anyway, Pokemon's great. Somebody out there laughed really hard at that joke, and I'm. That we are connected. I, I will also say, as has been previously expressed somewhere on the internet, uh, one of my Smash Brothers mains is Pikachu, so I'm not not a Pokemon guy. I'm just not a, a Pokemon games guy. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, Pikachu's adorable. Pikachu's great. we big fan. Um, anyway, so, basically, the kid decides if we, ne- we just need more of these kind of little doughboys... Um, that we can throw at him and just keep him distracted long enough to just completely steal the loincloth and, you know, get home scot-free. But it turns out that when they bring, like, a dozen doughboys, uh, that activates a dozen different Hastars. Um, Which Hastars. was such a great review or reveal uh-huh. because it was it was simultaneously, oh, fuck no, but also, like, well, what else would you have expected to happen? Like, I, it felt surprising in a way that was also inevitable which is my favorite like way to pay off tension in a movie exactly and it, it's a thing where it, it's that thing that you were talking about it's the Jean Dielman thing where it allows you to put those things together of mm-hmm. oh fuck okay they screwed up yep um and then that you know that just leads to a, on another very nice set piece another very wild uh set of moments and anytime we're dealing with the the monstrous figures in this movie is is a plus. Very very cool. Very fun. Hostar is such a great design. So we see, uh, basically four different monsters, including all of the multiple Hostars as one. Um, and I like all four of them. I think the makeup work on the humans is great. As we've discussed, the grandmother is just a hell of a design. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Hostar in that. So so rewind to the beginning of the movie um the film opens with this cgi sequence showing a statue of the goddess of of prosperity and all things and sort of her womb and her womb being filled by this horrible little you know hostile creature uh who looks just like a really angry baby at this point Uh and and this whole sequence is, is a cgi cartoon essentially and it's it doesn't look great and I was a little like, oh dear, because uh, yep. I, I I recently came under a bit of fire for being like, oh, the CGI in Indian films is not good, is it? And and people were like, well, fuck you, uh, whatever. Um, it's mostly so, not, but you just gotta deal with it. Some of us can't. Some of us <laughs> turned off the part of our brain that can deal with bad CGI. But that's it. Like we get an opening sequence. It's kind of segregated off. Like I said, it almost functions like a cartoon. So the fact that the CGI is a little rough was, like, actually pretty neutral. Uh, we get to Hostar, and I'm fairly confident, fairly confident, what we're looking at is a combination of practical makeup with some CGI sweetening. Like, I, I think there's got to be CGI involved, right? Uh, I think there has to be for some of that, like... That, that, that is a skinny-ass skin dude, skin texture, if that's yeah. not... If that's just makeup, that is a fucking skinny-ass dude. Um... And it feels really good because it doesn't, it's not convincing. Like, I don't look at it and I'm like, this is physically there. I'm sure of it. Uh, but but between the lighting and the just otherworldliness of the space, the, the sort of shimmery quality of the CGI works for me really well. Because it, it feels like he shouldn't look realistic. He should look like some sort of thing that is situated in the world wrong and and he does yeah. and he's he's got like this raw flayed looking skin and these just horrible horrible teeth and he's bright red and it's it's very good yeah and he's got this kind of this chameleonic quality his ability to kind of blend in with the womb walls so yes 
you're only seeing like these little kind of dashes of him as he approaches. Like you, it's easy to lose sight of him, which is even he's he's very slippery. It's 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 yes. a really really cool design, especially the way that he works within his environment. You're right. You know, I so so A plus monster work in this movie. Um, I mean that's that's where I was going. Just A yeah. plus monster work, but yeah, and, uh, sometimes and the, that's what you need. And this yeah, movie and gave the, it to me real hard. And the design of the grandmother is terrific too. There, one of the most horrifying scenes in the movie is just a scene of the uh, the mom clipping the toenails of the grandmother. Absolutely! Oh my god! Because her her kind of like bulbous distended foot kind it looks like a mossy tree trunk more than a human foot it's it does not look organic it i i sort of it felt to me like she was clipping the toenails off of like a chunk of coal but yes yeah. it it's it, it's this incredible basically yeah anytime you get to play around with that and then when when, when the humans kind of turn into greed monsters they they there's this which bulging. which happens if Hastar touches you. He doesn't need to bite you. He doesn't need to do anything. He just needs to make physical contact with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's how so I the, was reading it. I think they said something about bite, but then it kind of didn't play out that way. So I, I think you're right. Um, like, I think it could happen either way. Um, but the, the one guy, he gets kind of sucked into the wall, and yep. he's turning into the... It, it, it It's just, it's this kind of pulsating fleshy kind of david cronenberg situation that's very disgusting it sure is and we we know how i feel about that oh yeah great stuff um anyway we talked about is there anything you want to say about the monsters and the effects i feel like we've kind of covered covered I, our bases I, here. I feel like I, i've said what i needed to say um they're good and again like at a certain point you have to ask yourself the question what do I actually need above and beyond this excellent monster? And to a certain extent, the answer is nothing, and the film still gives me more than that anyway. Because mm-hmm. um, it does so, have that... So yay, because it's got all the gray. Yeah, it alternates between the gloomy atmosphere and then the incredible monster stuff. Um, I would say I'm more of a... For me, that's a little bit more of a whiplash, because we, we talked about what works for me and what doesn't. Sure. Because um, especially like on a story level... This you know it's it's an easy comic story like it it it's, oh absolutely it 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 is so thin and that's that's not <coughs> to its detriment necessarily but when when you're dealing with the things that aren't the monsters if the atmosphere isn't working for you you're like all right well people are just kind of doing their thing and that's gonna talk and that's about the money. thing is like I don't even know to what degree I believe that this film sincerely wants to be a fable about greed because its message absolutely is well greed's bad. Greed turns you into a monster, and that's the story, and that's not a story. <laughs> no, it's really not. That's, that's not even a Twilight Zone. Yeah, it, it just it feels if you look at it as a story, and then it's an hour and forty four minutes. You're like, oh, that's a uh, that's too many. <laughs> that's too many minutes. Um, but an extremely fleet running time for Indian cinema. So thank you to Timbad. Indeed, indeed. I. Uh... I didn't really realize until I hit play how long it was, and I was thrilled because I had blocked out some substantially more time than that. So, yeah, no, that 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 was a great thing. Although I would say, um, I really sorely missed a uh, closing credits musical number. Uh, when an Indian movie does not give me that, it makes me very sad. Um, it but gives it us it, it gives us a musical montage midway through the film. It does. I believe it has it has two: one in chapter two and one in chapter three. Oh, I think you're right. Uh, right. Which is it? It is a Bollywood thing. The Bollywood movies that aren't musicals do tend to have sequences that kind of just feel like music videos with kind of lyric heavy needle drops. Okay. Um. So it had a little bit of that, but other than that, it was not a very musical movie, which wouldn't necessarily have worked with what Tumbad is doing, and that's that's fair. But usually, when that's the case, you, you just sneak one in at the end. And I I do think in the context of all this, it is worth mo- uh, mentioning Jesus H Christ. <laughs> it is worth pointing out i think that was my portmanteau mentioning and pointing out uh somehow this is an indian swedish co-production oh that too. And like, yeah, yeah. i'm like okay i don't know where sweden happens but there's the name of several swedish production companies right there in the credits so yeah i mean i guess this is this is kind of in the same swedish vein as a movie like wither 
Um, like I'm just, not familiar with that. Yeah, just gooey monster Swedish thing. I'm sure, obviously this was his brainchild, so he probably just went to the people he thought would give him the most money to make this vision a reality. Yeah, I mean, like, we, we live in a world of transnational cinema. Like, people fund movies in other countries all the time. I was still thrown to learn that this was a Indian Swedish co-production. Yeah, very much. You, you do not Which, think of those two nations having much to say to each other. No, I, I wouldn't think so. Um, but that's also why I've kind of tried to avoid applying the word Bollywood specifically to Timbad. Right. Um, Bollywood is a very nebulous concept anyway, um, because there, it, it, there, there's no strict like line that has been drawn as to what is or is not Bollywood, because um, that is an English construct term put upon just kind of Hindi cinema as a whole. Right, and and it is Hindi, but it is also, as far as I'm aware, shot in... I'm seeing if I can find that real quick on the Wikipedia page. Uh, And the answer's not clear. Uh, Okay, there there were some scenes shot in Mumbai on sets. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I would say the, the the, the way that I have been trying to use Bollywood is to at least refer to, like, the mainstream like blockbuster tent poles of Hindi cinema that India is putting sure. out. Like that seems to be the, the safest definition and this isn't isn't that. Um right. in, in many different ways. Yeah, the the things that most align it with Bollywood cinema proper is are those music video montages and then did you notice whenever anyone's smoking that little subtitle that says smoking oh yes i wanted to, to i wanted to ask you because you know more about this national cinema than i do do they do that i have never seen it like literally on every frame of smoking but whenever there's smoking in a film they usually have a title card at the beginning that says there is smoking depicted in this film and it is injurious to health okay because because it's in this very tastefully discreet little little short pieces of text on the bottom left but as you say it's every single shot where there's a cigarette has that text in it and i was like well that's fucking weird (laughs) and and screw you movie i'm gonna go have a cigarette right now what do you think Mm. of that (laughs) that is philosophically a very uh indian cinema thing but i have not seen it done to that degree before (laughs) okay okay is a little distracting but you know you know do what you gotta do thank thank thanks (laughs) tumbad Um, but yeah, no, thank you for clarifying that. Cause I, I forgot that I wanted to ask you about that specific thing. Cause it, it is, uh, distinctive. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. But yeah, that, those are the two things that I'd say connected the most in my experience, of course. Um, but yeah, I think I've said the things I wanted to say about Timbad. Is there anything else you want to bring up before we uh, close? I, I think, up? I think I've said the things I want to say, uh, just that I, I don't have nearly the background in, in Indian cinema and Hindi language cinema that I think um, is increasingly becoming common in a way that it was not common even as recently as seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, In part because, as we all know, I am whatever the opposite of a size queen is, and I I see three-hour running time and my heart sinks, so I don't tend to seek out this national cinema. So so a nice, tight, 104-minute-long shocker is is right where i needed to be to have a good like get me excited about watching more indian cinema sort of experience yeah that's great you know you you, every, you need a an entryway um which is which is very fair um no and that's the same thing i, I have a similar approach to runtime but for me i love so much of the aesthetic values of bollywood cinema um that I'm still very picky about the ones that I approach because it's so much of my time. Yeah. Um, but it, that is something that I can kind of overlook where it's like, okay, um, even though I hate three hour runtimes as a rule, this is going to be, I have curated it for myself. And also I, I, I have a trust in the overall world cinematic worldview of this, this region that it's going to kind of treat me right. Ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's why I go with the musicals because a Bollywood musical is always, always, a, always a way to worm into my heart. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm very glad to have seen Tumbad. I think it's such an exciting and visceral uh, horror film 
and that's something that I I have been meaning to get more into the modern contemporary Bollywood horror because I've only ever seen you know the 80s slashers because that's very much where that's, my, that's my your, experience that's lies yeah and let me let me just say the Bollywood 80s slashers not so good most <laughs> of the time just like uh, the American 80s slashers exactly there's you know there there are the gems but a, it's a uh, it's a rough time Tumbad is yep. definitely the best horror film from the region I have seen excellent glad to hear that glad to hear that Anyway, even though I was cooler on it than Tim, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's it's certainly an experience. Oh yeah, and and un- obviously I recommend checking it out. Like I feel like that's been baked into every single thing I've said in the last hour. So yeah, and and so that's gonna do it for our, our, our talk on Tumbad. But uh, in two weeks we're gonna be returning with yet another film from a non-Christian religious milieu. Um, sort of. Sort of. It was made by. Uh, that milieu, but it's it, it about was it was made by white Americans who may or may not have themselves been Christian, but certainly, yes. Anyway, tell us what movie it is. But yes, it is it is about the Haitian voodoo culture. Um, it is a film that could have been watched by Vin Ayak during his lifetime. Um, it is the 1930s uh, film White Zombie. The uh, the first English language zombie film, no less. So. Yes, and it, very, this was a very important film. This is from that Val Luton unit, right? No, uh, this no, is no. you're thinking of. I walked with a zombie. This oh, is um, yeah. oh, this is some Poverty Row studio. I forget which one it was, but this was one of those movies that uh, post Dracula, when Bela Lugosi had a contract that allowed him to sort of go slumming with low budget filmmakers who were willing to spend the money. Uh, this might even be like his his first post Dracula film. I need to look that up before we record. Yeah, and and we will. We'll do the research. Um, this will be a first time watch for me, and I'm, I'm excited to check it out. It'll, I, it'll be at least a third time watch for me, which is probably two times more than the movie needs, and yet it has a magnetic uh, pull, just like Bella. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. Because I walked with a zombie is a is a pretty solid eh, for me. <laughs> Um, so if this one is the slightest bit trashier, that might actually help or, or the slightest bit more art artful, it might help. So well, it's definitely not more artful. Uh, yeah, I doubt it. Be, it didn't it sound might be trashier. like trashier. It might be trashier. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, so yeah, tune in, uh, in two weeks for that. And until then, uh, I don't know, check out more of my reviews and Tim's on alternate ending. Dot com. We've got a bunch of different podcasts. And in, including, actually, I'll just throw in a quick plug. Uh, I'm going to wait until this episode goes live, but I will then be posting a review of Tumbad, which was requested by one of our Patreons. So it's a sort of, I got to double up, and I feel good about that. So thank yeah, you. So I, yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs> we're, we're cutting some time out of... We, we saved you two hours to work on your thesis. <laughs> Amen. Um, but anyway, thanks, everyone. And, uh, you know, go watch Tumbad. It was fun. Bye. Ah! She hates.